So good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on the evolution of combating wildlife trafficking. What's next? My name is Patrick Ahern with RTI and I'll be helping out with the virtual room today. So just a quick note when you log in, your microphone and web camera will be automatically muted. If you have any questions for our presenters today, uh, please submit those into the Q&A window. Uh, if you run into any issues with the Zoom, you can reach out to me via email, which I'll drop in the chat, or you can uh, send me a message through the chat as well. Uh, so at this time, Kathy, I'll go ahead and turn the meeting over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. And good morning, good day, and good evening. Kathy Wachala, and I will be facilitating this discussion today. Um, RTI International is both a global research institute and a leading international development organization whose core mission is to improve the human condition. Patrick, can you switch um, slides? Thank you. RTI works both domestically and internationally, and our combating wildlife trafficking work resides under our International Development Group's environment portfolio, which I lead. Now, the intention of this panel is not to cover all aspects of what's next. In fact, this panel is rather ambitious. I have invited experts who work throughout the world and who have very distinct backgrounds and expertise in the CWT space so that we could try and provide a holistic perspective. I didn't wanna focus on one aspect of CWT, rather I wanted to attempt to provide a current snapshot of CWT efforts and then segue in discussing what trends we are seeing in the CWT space globally. As you can imagine, this could easily be a series of panels, but it's always important to take a step back and see what progress has been made to determine the best course of action for future work. Over the past 15 years, there have been gradual shifts in how stakeholders view illegal wildlife trafficking. Originally perceived as a biodiversity conservation issue, wildlife trafficking's ugly reality has shown its adverse effects on factors related to a country's national security, its economic development, and communities' resilience to climate change, as well as human health. What does the next generation of CWT look like in our work through community level engagement, policy, transnational policy, social behavior change, um, the gamut to get us that one step ahead of the offenders? For today's webinar, we will begin with opening remarks by Dr. Mary Rowan from USAID, and then invite the panelists to turn on their video for introductions in our discussion. Before I pass the mic to Mary, I'd like to give you a bit of her background. Dr. Mary Rowan serves as the Biodiversity Division Lead in USAID's Development, Democracy, and Innovation Bureau's Natural Environment Branch. She leads the division's conservation professionals in providing technical leadership, advice and support on USAID's global biodiversity programming, and she is the USAID technical lead on the US Government Task Force on Combating Wildlife Trafficking. Mary, thank you for joining us, and without further ado, I pass the mic to you. There we go, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Great, sorry about that. Technical difficulties to start. Well, um, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very happy to join everyone here today. As mentioned, I lead the biodiversity division at USAID and serve as the agency's lead for combating wildlife trafficking. Here at USAID, we work on combating wildlife trafficking in over 30 countries and the vast majority of that work is managed and, and programmed by our staff in the field. We apply a comprehensive we apply a comprehensive approach that strengthens law enforcement from parks to ports, reduces consumer demand for wildlife products, and builds international cooperation. Your question, what has been what is the uh, evolution of CWT over the past 15 years, is a very good one, and it's good to pause and reflect a bit. The current wildlife tra trafficking crisis gained international attention probably around 2012, a little bit before that. At that time, wildlife trafficking was seen as a low risk, high reward crime. I would argue that the global CWT community is making wildlife trafficking more of a medium risk, but still, it's, it is still very much a very high reward crime. And here are some reflections and some success on some successes, as well as where there's some still big challenges. First of all, let's recognize that this is a multi-sectoral issue. So I'd like to shout out to the US government's Combating Wildlife Trafficking Task Force, in particular, the Departments of State, Justice and Interior, as well as the other 14 agencies involved. 
from Interior's Fish and Wildlife Agents work with host country governments to build effective cases to the State Department's efforts to build political will for addressing wildlife crime as a serious crime, we are demonstrating how a whole of government approach brings tailored creative skills and capabilities to these from these agencies to a complex problem. And that's something we certainly work on around the globe, working on that whole of government approach. Initial CWT activities focused on efforts on strengthening the capacity of law enforcement. These activities worked along the entire enforcement chain, continuing anti-poaching efforts, which have been longstanding on the ground, but also building the capacity and commitment of police, prosecutors, and judges to bring criminals to successful pro prosecutions. And that work needs to continue and grow. We facilitated reforms to the legal and policy structures so that sentences reflect the severity of the crime, and that's increasing. At the same time, we've supported restorative justice programs in South Africa to support youth who get involved in poaching, sometimes with very little choice and few livelihood options. And we've built green courts and supported live courtroom monitors to improve transparency in the judicial process. And that is the role of civil society here is key and needs to grow. Capacity building means training and coaching, but also tools and technology. Early on in this process, we ran the Wildlife Tech Crime Challenge. And that started in 2014 to foster innovative ideas. One winner, for example, built forensic capacity for DNA testing in the field with MinION handheld DNA se sequencer, which has also been used by NASA in outer space. Not that they have a wildlife tracking problem up there. Um, beyond the tech challenge, our programs support development and testing of innovative solutions and technologies to address wildlife trafficking. For example, under our routes program, the Wildlife Sentinel app was developed. While developed for the, for the aviation industry, it can be used by anyone to confidentially report suspicions of crime or corruption, and our partners at Crime Stoppers International will collect and report that information to Interpol. You can download it on your phones. This and a broader body of work has led to tangible improvements in wildlife crime detection, response and deterrence. I think we've all seen the recent reports in the media of some big cases, including extraditions. Wildlife crime is in the news and efforts are reaching the middlemen and women and some kingpins. There's a lot more to do, but clearly the successes have raised the stakes from low risk. And I'm hoping that we continue to get to that medium risk and eventually high risk for, for the perpetrators of these crimes. More effective work along the enforcement chain needs to continue and grow. But what else is succeeding and where are we going in the future? What do we need to do to redouble our efforts and what are we missing? One area that needs significant attention is corruption. Corruption facilitates wildlife crime and often protects well-connected criminals from, enforce, from enforcement action. And corruption is quite difficult to bring up and put on the table in discussions with governments and others. I encourage you to take a look at the resources developed by our partners at Traffic and their consortium at the Targeting Natural Resource Corruption Project and their Knowledge Hub, which has a great many tools to address this vexing problem, including how to discuss this issue. And also it's worth noting to, to look at the work of the National Whistleblower Center, also working on corruption. Now switching gears quite a bit, while community-based conservation has been a USAID priority for decades, helping local communities conserve, benefit from, and coexist with wildlife has never been more important than it is now. Patrols of well-managed community lands not only prevent poaching and land conversion, they improve public safety reduce conflict among neighbors, and help address human wildlife conflict. The work needs to expand, but we need to create more sustainable income generating opportunities and work on alternative food sources. And talking about food, wild meat is still very important. It's also a threat to, to, to the wildlife populations. And with the mention of wild meat, clearly the past two and a half years have highlighted the risk of disease causing pathogens making the leap to humans from animals often illegal, illegally or unsustainably harvested from the wild. A concept for decades, One Health is now getting much more attention and across USAID, many sectors are implementing a One Health approach. For example, our wildlife traps program, which I think many of you have known for the past many years uh, managed by traffic, now focuses on reducing the, wild, the risk of zoonotic disease spillover associated with illegal and ill-managed wildlife trade. 
There is room to grow One Health and to collaborate more with our health and agriculture colleagues to address the drivers of wildlife consumption. There are other players in the fight against wildlife crime, such as industries that understand the risk of wildlife trafficking to their reputation and bottom line. The private sector is broad and is, has a huge role to play. And we've really only begun to, to engage the range of actors possible. I wanna highlight a notable success in engaging the private sector. The multi-stakeholder um, partnership led by WWF, traffic, others, um, uh, sorry about that, reducing opportunities for unlawful tra transport of endangered species or the routes project, project that I mentioned earlier. Working with the uh, traffic, working with the International Air Transport Association and Airport Council International, routes was able to respond to private sector needs and the risks that airlines and airports face as traffickers use their sector to transport illegal wildlife and wildlife products. Importantly, routes worked within existing systems such as preparing the content and material for airlines and airports to use in their international training systems. Making efforts work for the private sector that fit into their existing um, operations is critical for uptake and sustainability. Another highlight is, is work that many are doing with the financial institutions and the great work in terms of following the money. This work has helped bring in many non-traditional partners and increase the understanding of wildlife trafficking as a serious crime. And these efforts are continuing to grow and create great uh, help in prosecutions. Opportunities still abound for the increased private sector engagement and social media companies whose platforms are being used to broker sales of illegal wildlife products. And while there are successes, much, much more needs to be done to encourage social media platforms to police themselves improve their internal controls and monitoring to remove posts that are clearly not compliant with national and international laws. No look to the future of combating wildlife trafficking would be complete without a reference to Asia's continuing huge demand for wildlife products. We've seen a dramatic evolution of demand reduction programs and the successes that are possible with the adoption of the five-step social behavior change methodologies. But even with these investments, this is just a drop in the bucket in terms of what is needed and what we must increasingly focus on issues of scale and impact. We need to better understand the different roles and incentives of those driving the trade. For example, we have to increase efforts to work with the traditional medicine community and fully stop the importation of and improve the management of existing stockpiles of wildlife products like pangolin scales. The demand for pangolin scales is, is certainly driving all eight pangolin species closer and closer to extinction. So we need to focus on societal change as well as increase individual behavior change. Do we face challenges? Certainly. But we face daunting statistics all the time dealing with, with conservation. And in preparing these remarks, I am impressed with the number of sectors that we have managed to engage and build and grow over the last 10, 12 years. And I look forward to our discussion to hear more about how we can scale up, grow our relevance to and engagement with other sectors. And most of all, how we can move to the kind of transformative change needed in how we all relate to nature and wildlife. And with that, I want to say, I look forward to this panel. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mary. Can I ask the panelists to join us on video? Excellent. Excellent. Um, thank you. Today we have with us Sal Yang, Taye Teferi, Nora de Guzman, and Kurt Duche. I will give a quick um, intro to each and then we'll move on into the questions. Sally Yang works with the UN Environment Program in the Law Division, National Environment Law Unit. She is a law and policy specialist on environmental crime, particularly combating wildlife trafficking. Sally worked on USAID CWT programs since 2014 and led the development and implementation of law and policy strategies, strengthened political will and supported capacity building and the development of CWT tools across the ASEAN region. And that is actually where I met Sally. Taye Teferi has worked in a variety of conservation positions ranging from park warden to wildlife ecologist, as well as university researcher and lecturer. In 2016, Taye transitioned to traffic and its global wildlife trade monitoring network 
and took up his current position of Policy and Partnership Coordinator for Africa. Taye works with countries and regional bodies to root out illegal and unsustainable trade in wildlife and wildlife products, while supporting the legal and sustainable and safe use and trade in support of rural livelihoods and national economies. Um, fun fact on Taye, while still in high school, he was among the founding members of the Ethiopian Wildlife and National, or sorry, Natural History Society, which is currently the oldest and most established nature club in Ethiopia. I loved that. Nora de Guzman is the tech lead for demand reduction and social and behavior change communications on USAID's reducing demand for wildlife activity that is based in Bangkok, Thailand, a regional program. She supports the program through RTI's implementing partner, FHI 360. She had a similar role on USAID Wildlife Asia, a recently closed program that RTI International also implemented. Nora has 30 years experience leading large multi-year USAID funded social behavior change and capacity building projects, both as COP and technical lead in the health sector in multiple countries across Asia, as well as in Senegal, West Africa. Nora's technical expertise extend beyond social behavior change into training, social marketing, advocacy, social research, and project management. Kurt served as the CITES Scientific Authority of Non-Timber Fauna and Flora in Guatemala and worked as a technical advisor and director for the National Council for Protected Areas, or CONAP, for the government of Guatemala. He presided over the technical management of the National Zoological Park in Guatemala, obtaining two international awards and a regional conservation project. He is a founding member of the Scientific Association for the Conservation of Nature in Guatemala and currently works as an officer against illegal wildlife trafficking for the Wildlife Conservation Society in Mesoamerica. A huge thanks to you all for joining us. As a reminder to all of you listening in, please share any questions you may have for the panelists, Mary or myself, in the Q&A feature in Zoom. And I will kick us off with a question to Sally. Sally, you have been working with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, better known as ASEAN, for the last eight years. They are key to combating wildlife trafficking efforts in the region. Can you provide where combating wildlife trafficking policy efforts are in Southeast Asia currently? Thank you, Kathy. Uh, can you guys hear me just to be sure? Great. Um, thank you for inviting me to join this panel today. Well, I have had the opportunity to support the ASEAN Working Group on CITES and Wildlife Enforcement during my time with Freeland and RTI International, who were implementing the USAID Wildlife Program. So it was USAID Wildlife um, Arrest and, and, and the Wildlife Asia Program. So much of what I'll be sharing today on ASEAN's efforts will be from my experience then. As we all know, where there's legal trade, the opportunities for illegal trade are never missed by criminals, especially organized syndicates. This is where counter wildlife trafficking or CWT, as we mentioned, efforts come into the picture. The CWT efforts in Southeast Asia really kick-started as early as 2005 uh, with the setting up of the ASEAN Wildlife Enforcement Network or ASEAN WEN for short. The network was expected to deliver an effective coordination and information sharing mechanisms among the law enforcement agencies at national and regional levels in the fight against wildlife crime, including wildlife trafficking. In 2016, uh, ASEAN WEN merged with the ASEAN Expert Group on CITES to form the ASEAN Working Group on CITES and Wildlife Enforcement to achieve more synergy and alignment in tackling the wildlife trade, both legal and illegal. Just to clarify, CITES is an acronym for the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, an international agreement between governments. It aims to ensure that international trade in specimens of wild animals and plants does not threaten the survival of the species. So with Thailand as the lead shepherd for CWT and as chair of ASEAN in, two, uh, in 2019, ASEAN convened a special ASEAN ministerial meeting on illegal wildlife trade. That was in March 2019, where ministers and representatives came together to issue what is now known as the Chiang Mai Statement. The Chiang Mai Statement recognized and addressed key issues in CWT efforts and committed to, amongst other things, taking urgent action to end poaching and trafficking of protected wildlife and address both demand and supply of illegal wildlife products combating illegal wildlife trade in the region by ensuring continued efforts and perseverance through the region's knowledge sharing, 
cross-border coordination, regulations, and enforcement networks, strengthening regional actions to tackle illicit financial flow associated with uh, illegal wildlife trade, including anti-corruption and anti-money laundering, enhancing related domestic legislation to give deterrent effect to wildlife offenses and to strengthen enforcement efforts in fighting against transnational organized wildlife crime, collaborating with other partners to strengthen efforts in tackling the illegal wildlife trade, such as establishing enforcement coordination mechanisms, closing domestic wildlife markets where they contribute to poaching and the illegal trade, and last but not least, enhancing demand reduction efforts. This became the definitive mandate on CWT for ASEAN. And the ASEAN Working Group on CITES and Wildlife Enforcement developed its five-year regional plan of action for 2021 to 2025 to implement the commitments made by the ministers in the Chiang Mai statement. So in summary, that is, or in a nutshell, that is the current policy within the ASEAN region. Thank you, Cathy. Thanks, Sally. Before I go to the next question, which is to Kurt. Kurt, when I pronounced your name, my French kicked in and I said, Duche, can you correct me on how your last name is pronounced? Yeah, my last name is Duche. Thank you for that. Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Since you're in Guatemala, I thought, oh no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, the next question is to Kurt. Kurt, many people who are somewhat familiar with CWT efforts associated automatically with Africa and Asia, but not necessarily Central and South America. Can you share a snapshot of what CWT looks like in the region with which you work? Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy, and uh, good morning and good evening to all the participants and panelists. Uh, well, Mesoamerica uh, is in the, in the middle between South America and North America. We are an obligated path uh, from South to North for drugs, migrants, illegal cattle, and illegal wildlife. Uh, everything illegal that's going north or going to uh, all the Caribbean should pass from through Mesoamerica. So we're not uh, only used as a, as a path, but also an, uh, a source of origin of wildlife. We are not that different uh, in terms of uh, IWT from other parts of the world, Asia and Africa. Just, I, I would say we differ in size of the animals, but in amount, uh, we have very high numbers and, um, and something that we, we should notice. Our traffickants uh, have very high syndicates, very organized syndicates that goes from South America to Mexico, being Mexico one of the biggest buyers in the region and transit to the US. Our region is exporting wildlife to Asia, to Europe and to North America. We, are, we, are, we don't have just one region that's buying all our uh, wildlife. And it's all, not only wildlife, but also timber. We have big timber, illegal timber syndicates taking um, high precious wood from Mesoamerica and bringing them to Europe, the US and also Asia. In 2015, 2018, we had this rosewood uh, boom uh, that, where they extracted almost 80% of rosewood from Belize, Guatemala and Honduras and take it to Asia. And now they are migrating to other similar species as rosewood. So they are evolving as the market uh, becomes very difficult for traffickers because some species are being listed in societies or being more easily identified by uh, government officials. They are moving or migrating to other species that they that are not regulated uh, locally or internationally, but they are being used. So, um, I know I have a time limit, so I will say the, the key species that are being trafficked in Mesoamerica are parrots and macaws. Those are for local commerce. Small New World primates, that's something very alarming because they are killing the whole troops to um, uh, traffic uh, young primates in Mesoamerica to, the, to Mexico and to the US. Freshwater turtles, that's a big boom right now. Very easy to traffic, very easy to transport and very hard to identify. Timber rosewood, small reptiles and frogs. They are taking all of our endangered endemic um, reptiles from Mesoamerica and taking them mostly to Europe. And also what is starting now and what we see coming is the jaguar. Jaguar parts are being commerced internationally in our countries and internationally 
being uh, named as the American tiger by some Asian countries. So they are targeting now the wild jaguars in uh, Mesoamerica and South America for uh, their peace clause and peace most. I will say that with the time. Thank you. Thanks. That's incredible information about the jaguar. Um, Nora, this question is going to you. We're going to switch a little bit and talk about um, social behavior change, since you are the expert. Why use social behavior change in combating wildlife trafficking, and what are the key ingredients to social behavior change success? Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for inviting me to this panel, and hello to everybody in the audience. Well, just as an overview, uh, previous campaigns to reduce demand for wildlife products were mainly awareness raising campaigns targeting general populations with conservation messaging. A situation analysis in 2017 concluded that these campaigns succeeded in increasing awareness of the public, but have not significantly reduced demand among those who actually use and desire to use wildlife products. This is because conservation messages have not resonated with this consumer group. So social and behavior change, or I call it usually social and behavior change communication or SBCC, aims to shift individual behaviors and social norms through communication interventions. USAID Wildlife Asia successfully applied SBCC to reduce demand for wildlife products. Wildlife Asia followed, as um, Mary uh, actually referred to it, the five-step SBCC process judiciously to plan, implement, and evaluate demand reduction campaigns that targeted current and likely consumers, not general populations. So post-campaign evaluations in China, Thailand, and Vietnam are uh, geographic coverage, meaning country coverage for USAID Wildlife Asia, demonstrated significant reductions in demand measured by desired attitudes, intention to purchase in the future, and perceived social acceptability among the sample of current and likely consumers who actually recalled the campaigns compared to 2018 baseline research. So what are, were or what are the key ingredients to success? One, USAID Wildlife Asia used research to understand consumers' social demographics and factors driving their desire for wildlife products. Well, just for example, drivers identified were the practice of gifting with wildlife products in China, status for rhino horn in Vietnam, perceived beauty of ivory, and beliefs in the power of ivory and tiger products to bring good luck and prevent harm, we call it spiritual beliefs, in Thailand. So campaigns promoted uh, messages that aim to counter or address these specific drivers. So in order to confirm appeal and resonance among the target audience, the messages were pre-tested among actual consumers or likely consumers, or if not possible, those with the same consumer profiles. So secondly, Wildlife Asia employed a mix of SBCC strategies. So there are basically three SBCC strategies or SBC strategies, behavior change communication that directly addresses consumers or the target audience, and then social mobilization that uh, addresses influential organizations, and then advocacy targeting policy changes, both in the government and private sectors. So to directly reach consumers using BCC, Campaigns use social media and outdoor media that consumers regularly access. Again, based on research, we were able to find out what are the channels that consumers usually use to access information and entertainment. To mobilize those who influence consumers, organizations like the Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the International Network of Engaged Buddhists in Thailand were engaged to echo and expand campaign messages. So social mobilization efforts aim to create a conducive social environment for the desired behavior change or to change social norms. So as I said, SBCC aims to change individual behaviors and social norms. 
So Wildlife Asia also monitored campaign implementation through digital analytics and online mini surveys to determine whether the audiences targeted were actually being reached and engaged and took adaptive management actions accordingly. So I think this is a key element to the success of the campaigns. And then fourth, evalu evaluation surveys, which were done after the campaigns ended. So I call them post-campaign surveys. Measured target audience recall of the message to determine the campaign's impact. This is compared or against the previous CWT campaigns that assess campaigns mainly through uh, estimated reach. So this is recall and there's reach. Reach is usually defined as the number of impressions or number of views in social media or uh, estimated foot traffic or vehicle traffic for outdoor media. So these post-campaign surveys correlated message recall with changes in attitudes, intention to purchase, and social acceptability, and compared them with baseline data from our 2018 surveys. So USAID reducing demand for wildlife is currently continuing these successful campaigns in China and in Thailand. So I end there. Thank you. Thanks, Nora. I went ahead and shared a link. Um, you had referenced a few materials, as did Mary. So I shared the link. Um, and I encourage the panelists, if you're referencing information or documents um, in your responses, please feel free to share the link with the rest of the audience. Taye, the next question is for you. Can you provide details of the current Pan-Africa strategy combating wildlife trafficking and which countries are engaged? Uh, thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, it's very pleased to be here. Um, I would say probably there are a number of strategies, but the most important Pan-African strategy is the strategies that have been developed by the African Union Commission with technical support from traffic that was launched in 2015. Uh, it is called Africa Strategy on Combating Illegal Exploitation and Illegal Trade in Wildlife in Wild Fauna and Flora in Africa. It had gotten the highest level of endorsement by the heads of states, all 54 members in Africa. It is a framing strategy that has guided the development of regional wildlife uh, combating strategy developments, for example, for the East African community, for the SADC community, for Central Africa. It has also guided the development or revision of national strategy. So this overarching strategy has come basically with seven major objectives that guides the basically the development of the subsumed strategies under the regional and national processes. Uh, as an example, let me just cite one or two things. For example, it talks about high level political commitment from governments, it talks about uh, integrity and governance, engaging with consumer states. And as an example for that is how the African Union Commission through its engagement with China and African member states with their engagements with China through what's called uh, Forum for Africa and China Cooperation, FOCAT, that actually led to the closure of the ivory market in China in 2017. I would not say it's only because of this. There are a number of international organizations and NGOs that are working at this, but the, the political engagement from the African Union and, and the African member states was quite crucial. For those who may not know this, this uh, acronym FOCAC, Forum on African China Cooperation, this is the premier platform do, through which African member states engage with China on trade and development. Starting the year 2000, every three years, it meets at the highest level, at the ministerial level and often at the head of state level. And they discuss trade and investment. And through the advocacy of NGOs like Traffic and WWF, environmental and social sustainability has come into that discussion. And so the African wildlife strategy has embraced that approach and continues to engage in that process. It talks about capacity building of producer states or source states, I should say, transit and, 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 and consumer states in detecting wildlife products, 
in how they are trafficked. And it also talks about fighting the negative impact of the illegal wildlife trade on, on national economy, security, and stability. And finally, also engaging in social behavior communication, like a colleague said earlier, but also making tools available to those that are on the front line. So traffic as, as the main technical advisor to the African Union Commission, which helped develop the strategy, has an MOU to help roll out the implementation of the strategy. And a lot of the tools that have been developed by traffic are available to not only the African Union Commission, but also to the member states in terms of their strategy. So our on ground work actually supports the number of the, the, the countries as they roll out this strategy. And I think a number of those has been mentioned by Dr. Rowan earlier, for example, through work through routes, through traps, we have an, a very uh, elaborate uh, information sharing system called Twix, Trade and Wildlife Information Exchange, which uh, coordinate, which engages law enforcement officers in which they can share confidentially actionable data to actually act or on intelligence. There is a capacity building component which goes from uh, uh, for law enforcement officers from investigations through prosecution to the judiciary. All of this embedded as embraced under that, that strategy. So what I would say then is this framing strategy has been the main driver because you've asked for Pan-African strategy, the main driver that has basically kept alive the updating revision and, 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 and development of the, the various strategies in all of the African countries. These are 54 African countries. Thank you. Thank you, Tai. That is a lot to unpack, a lot of information. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Kurt, um, shifting gears a little bit, I really enjoyed having a conversation with you about some of the work you're doing, especially at the community level. Um, you have extensive experience in creating a customized approach to combating wildlife trafficking in a specific area of Guatemala. I'd like um, if you could share this tailored intervention and the unique way in which you measure the reduction of combating wildlife trafficking through that work. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I would like to share with you and the, uh, all the audience um, two experiences that we have in Guatemala mostly. Um, key in combating wildlife trafficking is community engagement. If you get a community to be engaged in the protection of a species or a protection of an habitat and make them um, aware and uh, make them a livelihood to protect that uh, part of the biodiversity. They will do it and then you will have success. Um, resilient communities to traffickers does 50% of the work of counter wildlife trafficking in uh, on a specific species like scarlet macaw. Um, there are only three um, breeding places for the scarlet, Central American scarlet macaw. And it's a subspecies and lives in Mexico, Guatemala and Belize. One of the nesting places in Belize, the other one in Guatemala, and the other one in Mexico. Just three nesting places in the whole world. And the nesting place in Guatemala is near a community called Paso Caballos. So they were poachers for 30 years. They were poaching the, the, the scarlet macaw chicks and selling them because they are a very poor Mayan community living uh, uh, out in the jungle. So you cannot go to that community and tell them you cannot poach anymore and you have to live off something else. You need to take the community something that they can live off and stop doing uh, the poaching because they have something, uh, a way of living. So we started hiring them to protect the nests. And then when we start hiring them and they start receiving money for protecting the nest, they continue working with us. And in, I can tell you that in the past six years, no single chick has been poached in the nesting place of Guatemala in Paso Caballos because the community will not allow any trafficker to go through their community to the nesting places to take those chicks. Then they live in a national park. It's a very unique situation. This community live in a national park and they had to comply with the government. So they, the government put in a lot of uh, um, loss on that community. If they want to stay there, they need to comply with the government. And they ha have no means to comply with the government. So we, as civil society, are supporting this community to comply with the government, to stay in a national park and live 
uh, among the, the biodiversity and natural park. So they are complying with the government, not poaching, not boarding the forest, and uh, using biodiversity in the only way the government uh, allows them to. Um, so they are happy. They have a livelihood. We are supporting them to stay there. We don't have the perpetual motion machine that will make them live out of their businesses forever. We know that they need to be, um, they really need to uh, this uh, extra support every year. Somebody has to pay for conservation. Conservation is not easy and will not, and it's not free and will not pay itself anywhere in the world. Conservation will not pay itself. So somebody has to pay for conservation and we're paying this community, not paying, supporting this community to uh, preserve the environment, preserve the species. I, I know I have a few more time, but I want to tell you that in timber, we have a community that was uh, extracting timber from uh, the Maya Brazil Reserve in Guatemala. So we start giving them another livelihood that for not them not to get involved with the timber traffickers. So now they are uh, with a honey project, they are keeping bees, they have a poultry project, and they have a conservation project in their community. So they don't, they don't have the need to get involved with traffickers and say, so they don't, uh, they will want to do it. And how do we measure it? Well, we promise our donors that none, not a single one of the members of the community will be caught in a trafficking business. They will never be caught by police. They will never be um, involved in a in illegal um, uh, activity. Um, and it has been happening for the past far four or five years. No community member where we are supporting has been ever caught uh, doing something illegal, not wildlife, not uh, cutting timber, not anything. Maybe they are doing it very well and they're not being caught, but we assume that uh, the projects are, are uh, successful so that they are not getting involved. Sorry for taking so much time. No, that was great. I, I What I like about that is I do think that um, co combating wildlife trafficking can be considered a very daunting endeavor um, because it, it hits across local, regional, national, transboundary, and then it also hits um, a variety of pieces like I said before, and, and what Mary also intimated, it is not just a conservation issue. Having said that, it is a, it does have its immediate needs and its long-term um, needs. And so that's also a hard balance to create. Um, and I think that's why I really enjoyed, um, I know we can't cover everything in this, but I enjoyed being able to pull together a panel that has all of this experience in a variety of different um, mechanisms or um, expertise in combating wildlife trafficking at a community level, policy, the different types of tools we try to use, um, because that just shows the dynamics and the um, complexity of the issue. Um, so I, we are getting good questions in the Q&A. Thank you for that. We are not ignoring them. I have a few more questions for the panel. Um, and this this we're going to transition now into kind of looking ahead. Um, and so Sally, you have the next question from me. From your vantage point, what are the next interventions needed via policy for combating wildlife trafficking specific for trends you're seeing in Southeast Asia? Thank you, Kathy. Uh, it's a hard question to answer because there's so many that I can think of. Um, but in my personal view, and if I really have to choose at ASEAN level, what is most urgent and needed is the cross-sectorial collaboration and integration of strategies. So ASEAN comprises of three pillars, the economic pillar, where the ASEAN senior officials on forestry sits, where the ASEAN working group on CITES and wildlife enforcement falls under its purview. Um, then the political security pillar, where the ASEAN senior officials on transnational crime, or SOMTC, sits. SOMTC has recognized wildlife and timber trafficking as a priority crime since 2015. And the third pillar is the social cultural pillar, where the ASEAN senior officials on environment sits. Now, we must not forget that wildlife crime is ultimately an environmental crime, and it also affects the community very deeply. 
other ASEAN associated bodies such as ASEAN Centre for Biodiversity, ASEAN Four, which comprises of ASEAN um, um, leaders in uh, the police community, and ASEAN Interparliamentary Assembly, the lawmakers, the legislative, should also be part of the equation. Wildlife trafficking is a cross-border, cross-sectoral activity. Successful and effective CWT efforts requires all three sectors to work together. And that means having coherent and complementary policies and meaningful coordination. Otherwise, it will not work. Um, I mean, there are specific trends. Uh, One Health is very much in center stage, but perhaps we can address that later. I'll hand that back to you, Cassie. Thank you, Sally. Taye, I have the same question for you with um, in the African context. From your vantage point, what are the next interventions needed via policy for combating wildlife trafficking in Africa? Okay, thank you very much, Kathy. So I'll cite a couple of examples. The first one really is along the lines of what Kurt was saying earlier, to strengthen the role of local communities. These are the resource custodians. These are the people who had lived with the wildlife prior to these other systems coming in and hiding away and making a profit of it. So if the engagement of the local communities is meaningful and there is, they have agency over the natural resource, then one can blend scientific approaches with indigenous knowledge and, and, and create positive incentives for them to not only engage in legal and sustainable use, but also see this as an asset to themselves. And, and then they become the, basically the resource custodians. They're the frontline uh, defenders of the, of the wildlife. This, there are a number of examples, a number of pilots have been done, but we haven't been able to scale this up. And I think that is in terms of long-term sustainability, uh, this is the way to go. And, and I think a lot of strategies are certain in Africa recognize the importance of this, even the multilaterals, you can see, for example, within the, 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 the CBD, there is an, an, a number of targets that are moving towards that, and the, the CITES as well, trying to really increase the role and engagement by local communities. And, the, and so this is the next thing on the horizon, and this should be ratcheted up and engaged proper, properly. In parallel, because the criminal syndicates are not sitting and watching, they are actually moving faster. And the, the way they, they are trafficking, either the way they're hiding their goods, um, they are, the way they're shifting routes, we have to stay on top of that process and continue to engage in, time, in the sharing of timely information between law enforcement agencies. Uh, for example, I would say, you know, we used to worry a lot about rhinos and elephants. That was a big thing. Then they, when they realized that that was a bit difficult, they shift to pangolins. And I don't know, for example, among the, the, my colleagues who have heard of Bezor, B-E-Z-O-E-R, have a look at it. This is porcupines are being hammered, basically slaughtered because of this thing is uh, undigested food that's in the stomach of uh, a rare, uh, one of those older uh, porcupines. Apparently it is important. I've somehow it's claimed that it has medicinal value in TCM for against cancer, against diabetes. And even the law enforcement officers have woken up to this reality. And what is tragic about this is not all porcupines have it. You probably have to kill 10 to get for, for one of them. And so I say this, even uh, certain colonies of termites have become targets for poachers because of the apparent TCM value. So all this to say that we really have to monitor the shift in, in, uh, in the transport route in the way they hide goods, uh, wildlife products. For example, we're beginning to see in Africa that instead of actually transporting a big ivory, full ivory or rhino horde, which can, can be easily be detected, there are some pro there is some processing that's going on within the continent so that you know either a shaving or a powdered form of rhino horn can get out of the, con the continent and some of the law enforcement officers should be trained in terms of how best to detect this using forensics dogs various approaches so that's the second area the third area i think has been alluded to by the colleague from from uh, asean is harmonizing these uh, regional processes between countries and for us to work very strongly within the FOCAC platform to strengthen the capacity of especially customs officers in terms of uh, having information sharing mechanisms, sites management authorities, 
so that we fight the corruption under that. Because sometimes some of these things are disguised under the legal trading system, falsification of permits, uh, false declarations, and, 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 and sometimes also going under, including an online trade system. So this is another area that we have to really focus on and work with uh, those that provide the platform. So these areas would then strengthen, why do we strengthen the, the fight against the, the trafficking? We should also enable the communities to actually be the frontline defenders. Thank you. Taya, that was really good and a perfect segue to a question to Kurt. Um, as we look ahead, some of the topics this panel and I discussed before doing the webinar was um, seeing some trends in online trade, um, recognizing that One Health is becoming um, a concept to utilize in combating wildlife trafficking and, and in its consideration, as well as um, gender and social inclusion. Um, so to Kurt, there is an expansive online community that utilizes various platforms for illicit activity. What trends are you seeing with online trade in Mesoamerica? Thank you, Katia. Um, I promise I won't take long with this. Um, we have been seeing that online trade is uh, a huge market right now. And at the beginning, a couple of years ago, 2017 and 18, when we started monitoring, we thought that the deep and the dark web and all those uh, nebulous stuff was the where uh, while after was the trading. And, and it's not true. It's in the surface. It's in, the, it's in Facebook and Twitter and WeChat. Um, you can find anything online, and sadly, in Mesoamerica, the illegal trade on jaguar parts has shifted from South America to Mexico. And right now, Mexico is the international hotspot for the illegal trade of jaguar parts. They are selling jaguar parts in Mexico, and they're exporting um, jaguar parts from Mexico. And how is that important? I saw one of the questions in the QA uh, of the amount. Of, uh, is it... Uh, a large amount. Well, it is not a large amount, but remember, we only have 2,000 jaguars in, in the whole range. It's not like elephants, you have 50,000 plus elephants. We only have 2,000 jaguars. So if you take 200 jaguars to put it, it that's uh, about the number that are in the illegal trade right now in part 200 jaguars in Mexico uh, that have been killed and being sold on the internet. So you have a large, a large part of the population on, on the market. You can buy in Guatemala, you can buy parrots, you can buy endangered frogs, you can buy a bronies, a, a lizard. Uh, you can buy them in the whole uh, Mesoamerica countries. You can find illegal wildlife on Facebook marketplace, on Facebook private groups. Uh, you can buy all kinds of turtles, all kinds of birds, all kinds of reptiles on, on the internet. And if you, if you are part of a private group that is in, in Europe, uh, Czech Republic, you can find endemic, highly endangered species of reptiles from the whole Mesoamerica, from Southern Mexico to Colombia, being sold in Czech Republic. And even species that are appendix one, as the um, um, Charles Verde lizard of Guatemala Bended lizard, it's appendix one on CITES, and you can buy them on Czech Republic on a Facebook private group. So it's impressive. The, um, impact that the internet is having on wallet because it's hard to detect how hard to stop and very easily to access you as a client if you are a client and you want to buy this and you have the money you can in five minutes you can have uh, the contact you can have a whatsapp or a widget or someone that will sell you whatever you want even you can buy ivory in mexico you can buy rhino horns in mexico how are those rhino horns coming to Mexico and why? We don't really know, but you can buy almost anything in Mexico. Imagine what you can buy on Europe and what you can buy in the US. That's how, it, how hard it is with online trade. It's everywhere. And also it's already banned. Facebook has banned, Mercado Libre and all other um, trade companies have banned the sale of animal and animal parts, but the traders have their codes and you can find it with an image. Um, so if you know what you're looking for, you can find it very easily and you can buy it very easily. So it's a challenge for the future and we need to look forward on how are we going to address that and how are we are going to catch those traffickers and 
change the mind of the buyer. Thank you. Kurt, all of the <clears throat> questions you just had the last minute of your discussion is exactly what Nora had started looking at in um, a digital deterrence campaign um, with social behavior change and communication. So what you just painted is, sounds incredibly dismal and insurmountable. Um, so Nora, the next question, which is, is a tough one, <laughs> um, <laughs> given, given all of that, um, uh, all of the, you know, the hoops and how basically the illicit, illicit work has been able to go beyond you know, in this in this um, technology advance with the webs with online um, illegal trafficking, um, do you see digital deterrence campaigns as having value for future online combating wildlife interventions? Um, can you please describe it a bit and uh, let us know what the value is for future interventions? Okay, thank you, Kathy. Well, as Kurt said, there is a big, big uh, you know, there are a lot of sellers and buyers out there online in various websites and even on Google. So under USAID Wildlife Asia, we actually experimented. It was an innovation to try to deter uh, online, uh, potential online purchase of wildlife products through what we call a digital deterrence campaign. So what we did was... Uh, we served deterrence ads uh, to Google searches. This we only use the Google platform. And these Google searches were keywords that denoted possible interest in buying wildlife products. So the keywords were actually given to us by specific NGOs uh, who have actually experience in monitoring uh, online wildlife trade. So the ads, we developed the ads, and the ads aim to reduce the searcher's sense of online anonymity, because once you're online, you feel you're anonymous, and increase their perception of personal risk. For example, with messaging that said, uh, trade in traffic ivory or tiger is illegal. Undercover officers are online. So this was in, in Thailand. Although... Undercover officers were not really online, but this gave the semblance of your being monitored. So, and this message was actually the most highly recalled by respondents in the Thailand Post Campaign Evaluation Survey. So, uh, digital campaigns, I think, are very cost effective and very effective as well in deterring uh, potential purchase. And they are campaigns that use precise methods to target specific audiences. I mean, in our case, current and likely consumers of wildlife products, not only through search words, but through social demographic profiles and interests. So from Google in phase one, we actually moved to Facebook. So from Facebook, we, we use not necessarily search words, but profiles with interests. Of course, you will catch those who are actually not potential online purchasers, but at least you catch the small minority who are possibly uh, purchasing wildlife products or looking for wildlife products online. So digital campaigns also allow us to measure actual digital reach, not estimated reach, since digital analytics tracks ads that are actually served to or viewed by the target audience. And I would say that digital campaigns need to be continued and expanded. So not only because of the current situation, but every day new entrants are coming into wildlife consumer market. For example, those born in the 1980s and after, the Generation Y, they are called, are increasingly becoming affluent and status conscious. They are digitally connected and savvy and they like to buy everything online. Because of their social demographic characteristics, they are potential consumers of wildlife products. And a significant segment among them have intention to buy wildlife products in the future, actually based on findings from our USAID Wildlife Asia post-campaign surveys in China and in Thailand. For example, in Thailand, the 2020 
post-campaign survey showed that among respondents 18 to 24 years old, around 34%, that's one third, intend to buy ivory or tiger products in the future. The China 2021 post-campaign survey in Guangdong province found that an average of 18% of those who will likely buy wildlife products in the future are 18 to 30 years old. So I think that is why we get, we, there's a lot of room for our continuing and expanding and making further innovations on digital deterrence campaigns. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Um, I think when, when I think about how um, things have changed over the last 15 years in combating wildlife trafficking, one of the big pieces of the puzzle is technology. And we can certainly use it for us, but so, so are the offenders. And we need to try to keep that one step ahead. Um, one factor that, that Mary mentioned and um, Sally also mentioned was One Health. Um, and One Health as a concept has come up as um, an, an idea uh, and an understanding that obviously for healthy communities, you need a healthy planet, you need healthy environment. Um, so I would love to open the floor to a few of the panelists um, on the One Health concept, just to get an understanding of where One Health is um, as a concept in the region with which you work. Um, Kurt, I'd, I'd love to hear from you a bit for Mesoamerica, and then we can transfer on to Sally, and if anyone else on the panel has, has a comment or two. Thank you, Kathy. Um, we have a couple of veterinarians working in contra wildlife trafficking, in, mostly in, in Mesoamerica, Guatemala, Honduras, and Belize. <clears throat> and we're incorporating that point of view of One Health into contra wildlife trafficking, trying to understand if there is a real fact that uh, wildlife trafficking poses a risk to human health, hunting and the uses of meat and other parts poses a uh, uh, a threat to human health, and how is that um, spread over the Maya Biosphere Reserve in Guatemala, Mexico, and Belize? So we're starting to identify potential diseases in wildlife in the wild, not the trafficking animals. We're trying to identify the diseases on the wild animals without interfering with their lives. We're starting to use camera traps to identify ill animals and try to identify through expert wildlife veterinarians if those animals are ill or they are not. Um, yeah. And also, the, we have too many um, domestic animals going through the reserves, through the national parks, bringing parasites, diseases, bringing dogs, bringing chickens, mules, horses. And what does that pose a threat to the wildlife and back to the humans? So we are in the early phases of investigating uh, uh, the threats of uh, transmissible diseases in wildlife and humans. Um, we expect to have uh, clear results in, in mostly a year, we are, but we are already incorporating the One Health view into counter wildlife trafficking and also the monitoring of wildlife. Thank you. Sally? Thanks, Katie. Um, so within ASEAN, the One Health approach has been embraced largely across all sectors, as mentioned by Mary. Ironically, thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic, raising awareness on the interconnectedness of all sectors. So the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework was developed during this time to bring all three sectors together uh, to, to steer ASEAN out of the damage and loss caused by COVID-19 pandemic. Under its resilient uh, strategy, ASEAN Working Group on CITES and Wildlife Enforcement has been tasked to develop a policy brief on preventing of um, prevention of zoonotic diseases transmission from illegal wildlife trade. Of course, that cannot be done without a regional strategy on, on the same thing from wildlife trade. Um, and that is the mandate of the ASEAN senior officials uh, on forestry. Um, on the United Nations front, uh, UNEP uh, has been engaged since 2020 with the Tripartite Partnership for One Health, actually. The Tripartite being FAO, OIE, or now known as WOAH um, um, and WHO. 
and other institutions to strengthen environmental dimension in One Health. Um, in March this year, UNEP joined the United Nations Tripartite to form the Quadripartite One Health Alliance. And some of the work we have done included assessment on national biosecurity system measures in Laos, PDR, India, and Vietnam, and a review of regulations on wet market selling wildlife in Vietnam. A project, just very quickly, a project I'm currently working on is what we call the SAFE project, uh, which is linked to the One Health approach. SAFE stands for Safety Across Asia for the Environment. It's funded by EU uh, and jointly implemented by UNEP, UNODC, and FAO. Um, the SAFE project will undertake assessment of risks of wildlife facilities and locations with the aim to gain, gain better understanding of the threats, risks, uh, and to identify prevention measures from a legal and policy perspective, including the nexus with wildlife crime. Wildlife facilities may consist of zoos, laboratories, wildlife farms, wildlife market, pet shops, uh, restaurants serving wild meat, etc. So this is a regional project with four focus countries for now, Vietnam, Laos, state of Sabah, Malaysia, and Thailand. Thank you, Cathy. Thanks, Sally. Anybody else from the panel have a comment on One Health that they'd like to share? Of course, Nora. Yes, just very, very, very briefly. No, I think uh, One Health, at least as far as CWT demand reduction activities, provides the opportunity for us in demand reduction to be more socially inclusive, to reach out to uh, marginalized groups. Because tradition, I mean, definitely in the past, our SBCC demand reduction campaigns have targeted the affluent, educated, and um, urban sector because they are the ones who have the effective demand, at least for the four species that we have been focused on, uh, ivory, pangolin, rhino, and tiger. However, uh, for wild meat, and this is wild health, for wild meat consumption, aside from the more affluent segment, who actually desire wild meat uh, because of status or curiosity. There is a significant consumer segment, and this we have learned today from our var the various research studies that have been conducted by Chula Longhorn among the rural populations who are actually eating wild meat, bats, rhinos, snakes, uh, driven by survival. Also health reasons, they feel it's healthy and uh, spiritual beliefs. So I think uh, this is an opportunity for us to be uh, to widen our target audience segment to include those who are who have been left behind as far as our consumer demand reduction campaigns uh, have been implemented. So I think that's just a thought that I don't want to go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else from the panel before I continue? Uh -huh. Yeah, if, if you don't mind, Kathy, just, just a word only. Uh, I, I don't want to repeat what has been said. I think right from the beginning, Mary had pointed out this important project that traffic is running traps. And I see now information has been shared there for people to really look into that. This is really trying to very comprehensively look at the value chain in wildlife trade. And first of all, eliminate the illegality from that process. And then where there is legal and sustainable trade, how best to make that safe to guard against potential pathogen uh, sleepover or uh, crossover. So that project is quite comprehensive and I would urge people to have a, a look at the website and maybe even look at the, the latest report on it. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, I have one more question and then I'd like to open it up to, to the Q&A and I'll, I'll pass that on to my colleague, Lauren. Um, in terms of the private sector, it's also something that Mary mentioned in her opening remarks. I just wanted to get a glimpse um, from the panelists on where have you found the most success in engaging private sector specifically for combating wildlife trafficking? And Tai, actually, um, if you could share some of your thoughts on that from your okay. experience in East Africa. Okay, in the interest of time, I'll look at, it, at the private sector engagement and the, the value add that it has brought in two parts. First, in Eastern and Southern Africa, as most people would know, wildlife is actually owned by the private sector, especially in Southern Africa, including iconic species. So these, these, the private sector are stakeholders. So where we found good value with them was to actually build their capacity 
to have better management systems, especially on stockpile management in terms of registration and safekeeping so that it doesn't leak into the illegal market, especially with rhino horn. That has been the biggest challenge. Um, you know, private sector, the own it is private, they are a bit protective, they don't like to share information. So we have to find a way to work with them in a way that we'd only look at aggregate data, but that they have a safe proof system that they can secure their, their, their rhino and in some cases their, their ivory. And, and, and so that it doesn't feed into the legal uh, legal market. And that has been very productive by and large. The second part is the private sector. I think um, the, the Rouse project has been highlighted earlier by Mary in a similar way, working on road with road transport. These are the, the, the companies that actually ship to the port and work at ports. These are the, the uh, forwarding agencies and, and again, trying to show them what risk is involved in their business if they are not paying due diligence in terms of the goods they are bringing in. And sometimes they don't have the expertise. So then we provide the, the training in terms of detection approaches where, where they can get information and how they can get linked up, especially with customs people whom we have already built a platform for and they have the, the for example, the identification kits in, in, in case there is a suspicious cargo that's, run, that's moving. So all this to say that for the private sector, for these guys, one is a business risk if they get engaged in legal activity, there is support out there to help them. And they are also doing a good thing if they are you know, staying away from that process. And we built the capacity of those, especially in port authorities with big, large uh, shipping agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Tai. Um, Nora, I know you had an example for Vietnam. So why don't we wrap up private sector yes. with you? And then I'll ask Lauren to dive into the Q&A. So just very short, uh, again, under USAID Wildlife Asia with traffic in Vietnam, uh, we were able to uh, mobilize uh, the Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And this is really specifically targeting incorporation of wildlife trafficking or countering wildlife trafficking into the corporate social responsibility policies of the companies. So uh, after uh, an evaluation of this endeavor, after two years, we found that 50% of those who have attended actually um, the events and uh, orientations and workshops incorporated CSR into their company policy. So that's very short and brief. Thanks. Thank you. Lauren, I will hand it over to you. Happy to, and please to all of our attendees, remember that you can submit questions into the Q&A function of the Zoom chat, uh, not the chat, the Q&A function, um, and we'll be happy to incorporate those as much as time allows. Our first question comes from Crystal. This panel demonstrates how truly global illegal wildlife trade is. How do we foresee the evolution of CWT's coordination on a global supply chain scale? For example, are there any best practices when it comes to public-private partnerships, exchange of knowledge, or government-to-government government, government partnerships? to combat the illegal wildlife trade trade across the global supply chain? And this question is open to any of the panelists. I can start first. Um, so just from the enforcement point of view, there are actually, um, I mentioned ASEAN one and the ASEAN working group on CITES and wildlife enforcement. And there are actually a few uh, regional wildlife enforcement networks around the world as well, and also a global uh, wildlife enforcement network. So just addressing on the part of exchanging of knowledge and government to government partnership, I think that would be a good platform to build upon. Uh, at the moment, I believe that um, the, the, the global one is more ad hoc and they hold their meetings perhaps on a yearly basis, but um, within each uh, uh, enforcement network itself, there is a lot of room to be able to uh, enable exchange of knowledge. Uh, for example, again, coming back to ASEAN, just simply because I work with them, 
um, you know, in their work, uh, in their plan of action, they developed the ASEAN guidelines for detecting and preventing wildlife crime so that the member states could learn from that and also uh, agree on approaches um, on sharing of information and intelligence. These are the two important parts. Um, the ASEAN uh, has also developed a handbook on legal cooperation to combat illegal wildlife trade uh, as part of their action plan, and that is to um, provide the legal framework for all 10 ASEAN countries so that you know where they are when it comes to wildlife trafficking and wildlife crime and what are regulated and what are not. Uh, this provides a platform for them to be able to harmonize their laws and their regulations. As you know, wildlife trafficking is borderless. Kathy, if I may, just very briefly. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I think it's very, this is a very important question, but we also have to segment the question itself. First, we have to remember where we were dealing here with an illegal activity. So when you're th thinking of a global coordination and public-private partnership, you have to make sure that information actually does not leak. So by and large, the partnership in terms of fighting the illegality has to be contained within the governments. With, in fact, even within the governments with those particular agencies that can act on the information without the risk of losing the information to uh, corrupt practices. So in, on, on this, I think the, the, uh, uh, Sally had already pointed out about the development of this wildlife enforcement uh, networks. We have a fairly good one, for example, in Eastern Africa under EGAD, uh, and, and, and that is sharing nominal information and, 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 and working together. But for more actionable data, Traffic had developed a, 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 a platform called Twix, Trade and Wildlife Information Exchange, which is a, has a control access only to those that need to access it. These are law enforcement officers that can exchange actionable information very promptly, can seek help. Uh, we have, this is built on the EU Twix, which has been very successful, had celebrated its 15th anniversary a couple of uh, years ago, it's now going strong. So we have three of them in Africa. Now we have Africa Twix for Central Africa, Eastern Africa Twix, and Southern Africa Twix. So this brings together the relevant law enforcement agencies for information exchange coordination. And sometimes behind that, there is a lot of information in terms of you know, identification of species, where they can get help, and, and where if they, are, if they are stuck, even where they can get some legal advice. So there is quite a bit of coordination. What needs to happen is now to elevate this and find a way to coordinate with also countries or similar platforms on the consumer side, which 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 need, we need to evolve to. Thank you. Great, and I'm, I'm happy to step in for a second. And I agree with everything that's been said. I think one thing that's really critical is it has to happen at the level necessary and recognize that there's no one size that's gonna fit everything. For example, one of the successful things we've supported is, is sharing of information and, and building a, a cadre of forensic scientists. You know, forensics is a huge part in forming these cases and having someone in South Africa be able to talk to someone in Manila about a case and have that information. So it's that cooperation that has to occur at all different levels. Certainly cross-border, you know, having wildlife agents be able to talk to wildlife agents and foster that. So at the international level, at the regional level, and then at certainly cross-continental and sectoral level, um, there's a lot of, of cooperation that needs to be built. And it, it takes time. It's personal relationships as well as, you know, having it, having our, our, our leaders talk about it in international fora. So um, it's something we all have to work on at every level, I think. Uh, thank you. Thank you, panelists. Our next question comes from Robin. How does the trafficking for the pet trade compare to the amount and impact of trafficking for products? I imagine the demand for pets is lower, but removes more wildlife from environments to offset the lethality of the trade. Is it as significant? I see for, for me. Thank you. Um, I would like to say that uh, if maybe the volumes are different, 
um, but last year we have uh, 27 maritime containers of timber going out of Mexico, coming from Guatemala, illegal containers. But we also had five scarlet macaw being extracted from Belize. And that five scarlet macaws represent 1.6% of the world population of scarlet macaws. If you translate that into elephants, that's 500 elephants, right? Five macaws correspond to 500 elephants in terms of population. So if the product trade is large amounts. You can see containers, full containers full of timber. But if you see a shipment of freshwater turtles coming out of Mexico to Asia for the pet trade, 15,000 mud turtles. That represents 15% of the whole population of Mesoamerican mud turtles. So the pet trade is as dangerous, as um, bad as product trade because it decimates entire populations and it brings them close to extinction in many, many species. So it's not as large in, in, in terms of volume, but if you compare it in percentage, is I would say, better than product. It's a very great, great question. Yeah, if I may add just a little, I think the pet trade is the worst in particularly in, on, in, in the turtles, but also ornamental fish. Ornamental fish and birds are, are really a, a, a serious thing. And what we should recognize is these criminals operate in an ecosystem. They don't just go with one. So whichever is the easiest route, so it's part of the business design there. So if we say it's not as important, and I really believe it is quite a serious problem, we are actually basically you know, allowing them to grow into a more expanded scope of illegality. So it is very serious. It should be tackled as with the same vigor as we, we, we do with iconic species. And what, what is uh, worrying now, what we're seeing, I don't, I don't know if my colleague from Mesoamerica has detected this, is with the pet trade now, uh, they're going into a barter system. They, the, the, because they realize follow the money is beginning to be picked up on by law enforcement agencies, they're actually trading this with drugs. So money is out of the system. Uh, or, or even with secondary equipments. We have seen a situation where somebody sends out two or three vehicles from, let's say, a consumer country. I, I would not say well, to a country, and then the other guy sends some some animals or birds in return. So the, the, they are very dynamic in their approach, and this is where we really have to basically closely monitor the movement in terms of what goods are coming in or what goods are going out. Because in the past in Africa, we're not worried about things coming in because there was very little that's illegal that comes in, in here. Certainly those of us who are in the wildlife sector, but now we're be beginning to see some tricky approaches. So it's very important to really track some of these changes and then they, you know, hit them and hit them in the bud before they, they actually take root. Thank you. If I may just very quickly add as well, uh, we also have to consider the high risk because of the high contact and close contact with human beings of transmission of zoonotic diseases from the pet trade. So that's, that's also something that needs to be taken into consideration. Thank you, panel. Um, our next question comes from Rajan. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. We should incorporate wildlife trafficking issues. I guess it's more of a comment, but we'd love to have your response to this. We should incorporate wildlife trafficking issues in our academic, primary, secondary, higher education, as well as training, induction, in-service curriculum or curricula. How might you all respond to that? With total agreement, I would say, uh, if you don't mind, I, I used to actually teach wildlife college at the university before I moved into conservation. With traffic right now, we have developed a number of modular uh, courses for the wildlife colleges. Uh, for those who may not know, there are two important wild, and now it's three, because South Africa is also open, three wildlife colleges in Africa that actually focus on wildlife management. And uh, some of their courses are a little generic. So we are bringing in this aspect of actually the illegal wildlife trade, how to address that, how to uh, develop a community approach to the process. And 
really moving to the wildlife economy in terms of more sustainable, legal, and safe approach to it. And so the Garwa College in Cameroon uh, has, a, has a number of programs. The Wildlife College in Moeka in Tanzania has an, a number of modular programs. And the South African uh, Wildlife College also has programs. But I think generally, this should be broadened toward institutions, uh, tertiary education institutions, and should be uh, you know, part of what our young leaders, uh, future leaders should learn. Thank you. I have right. something I can add. Oh, Nora, apologies. Go ahead, please. No, no, it's okay. No, no, no just, just to, I, I definitely agree and that's, uh, that this should be actually included in the primary and secondary uh, educational system and uh, as well as the college, of course, because as I have actually uh, described earlier, that a lot of the youth, 18 to 24, 18 to 30 years old, actually they intend to purchase wildlife products, significant uh, proportion among them, 30%. So probably this is because they have not been educated. So if they were educated, they would probably, we would probably have a reduction of this proportion. So it is really more of a preventative approach. So I definitely totally agree. Thank May you. I jump in? Of course. Yeah. Um, so just on the training part, right, so not from the academic, but um, uh, both USAID and UNET has actually uh, jointly developed curriculum for uh, judges, um, originally from uh, just wildlife trafficking, but because UNET was involved, we, we, we actually expanded it into environmental crimes and environmental law in general to train the judges because one of the issues uh, with um, enforcement is that when it comes to the judges, uh, they are not treated as a serious crime. And so uh, a lot of the offenders and perpetrators get away scot-free, right? Um, and so, so that's how the program was developed. So we are trying to do that and expanding that curriculum into an intermediate curriculum for Asia Pacific judges as well. So watch this space. Yeah, my my two cents was just going to be part of that, actually, Sally, so I'm glad you covered it. In addition to just the different levels of engagement on um, with trainings and academics, we um, RTI International implements several programs under USAID that, that works on combating wildlife trafficking or has components of combating wildlife trafficking in its biodiversity conservation work. And in Africa and Southeast Asia at, at varying levels, we've engaged either with um, biodiversity um, government entities, um, WACA is one of them, Taie, that you referred to. The others though are police academies and actually engaging, recognizing that it is a transboundary crime and the relationships and um, coordination efforts that Mary discussed before are incredibly key. And to be able to integrate some of that um, understanding at an academic level at the police academy or whatnot is critical. Um, and the other piece is we were able to hit primary on a former USAID program called Protect in Tanzania, where we um, had a grantee that created um, a cartoon book and the significance of conservation. It is, it is small, but it was mighty. And it went to all of the schools in varying districts that we worked in. We were a national level program. Um, and it really, it really hit the ground and you wanna see more of that. So um, I encourage us to also be looking at the, at the youth because as Nora mentioned, I mean, that's really where you get to the crux of it. So we are at time. Um, unfortunately, there are some great questions in here that we've not had time to get to, um, but perhaps we can ask our panelists to give their thoughts and we can share um, after the event. So Kathy, I turn it back over to you. I just wanna thank everyone um, for coming together with this panel. Thank you audience for your excellent questions. And I really appreciate all of the planning and discussions we had around this. Um, it was an ambitious panel to pull together in terms of thinking kind of big picture, countering wildlife trafficking, but I really do appreciate everybody. Um, thank you so much. And we will work on responding to questions that we did not get to um, and address them. So thank you. Thank you everybody.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.